we're going to have a short chat about the term isolation distance. We use it a lot in our other videos, so and it does bring up some questions. So isolation distance is about how far away we have to plant our varieties so that what we get at the end is true to type and grows what we expect it to. So you will probably notice that lots of different varieties have different isolation distances. And that's because it's dependent on their pollination mechanism. So whether they're self-pollinators, whether they're cross-pollinated by insects, or whether they're cross-pollinated by wind. And sometimes they're a mix, in which case we'll be using the biggest distance. So let's talk about self-pollinators. We don't generally have to have them very far apart from each other in the garden. And that's because they pollinate themselves either before the flower opens or the flower never opens. A good example of them never opening is peas. Um, so that insects can't get in there to um, transfer pollen to another plant. Um, lettuce pollinates before the flowers actually even open. So again, the pollen can't be transferred. We just need to keep them far enough apart in the garden so that we know which ones they are, because once they're mature and they're dried off, they can be much harder to, to um, distinguish from each other when they're, they're dead and brown. So if you're growing a couple of different varieties of lettuce, you don't want to get them mixed up. Um, you also want to keep your climbers a bit far apart because they can easily get between each other on the trellis. So later in the season, you want to be able to identify which seed is which. So that's why um, self-pollinators generally only need a couple of metres, three to five metres, say. <laughs> The other thing to note with self-pollinated varieties, when you plant them too close, you also run the risk of an insect cutting into those closed flowers and then walking across to a nearby plant and transferring pollen that you didn't expect to have happen. And if you're in Tasmania, you need to be aware of bumblebees. And I recommend that you go and find a, a um, seed saving group near you to find out about techniques to deal with them because they will get into all sorts of flowers that you don't expect them to. For most of Australia, the main insect pollinators are honeybees, um, supported by native bees and other flies and ants and wasps. So when we work out how far away we need to put our variety so they don't cross, we're taking into account the behaviour of those insects. So we make some assumptions also about um, the terrain, buildings that might be in the way, trees, windbreaks, or, or whether you're out on an open plain and it's easy for them to fly around. So honeybees are probably the main pollinators that we need to think about, as they are the ones who will forage over many kilometres and maybe transferring um, pollen between crops. But generally, when they find food, they will work in that particular area and stay in that place until they have exhausted that particular crop before moving on. So as long as there are other crops or flowers in between that and something it might cross with, where they can lose their pollen, drop it off somewhere else, clean themselves off, then you won't have the um, crossing problems. Plants that are pollinated by wind typically have very fine light pollen so that it travels a long way on the wind. So wind pollinated plants will probably have the biggest isolation distances. Again, we make assumptions about terrain, what you know might be in the way. Local knowledge will be key in working out how far you need to be. So the reason that we get a range given to us for the isolation distance is to allow us to have some wiggle room depending on our local conditions. So we can take into account whether there are buildings in the way or um, wind breaks that help us so that we might be able to be a little bit closer than the specified, you know, the biggest range. Um, the other thing to take into account is how important is the seed that we're growing. So if we're the custodian of something really, really rare and we, our risk, um, we don't want to take any risks in that having that crossed, we want to use the biggest isolation distance offered. But if we're growing something just for fun, for ourselves, and we can easily buy it back from 
you know, a seed catalogue, then we might be prepared to just go with the smallest distance suggested. So nature isn't always black and white. So sometimes we don't get what we expect. So even though we count things, say, as self-pollinators, things can go wrong. Um, if you don't get things that are true to type and it seems to happen regularly, again, go and talk to your local seed savers group. Someone will be able to help you. There are alternatives if you can't get this, the isolation distances suggested and you still want your seed to come true to type. And they mainly include using physical barriers like caging or bagging to exclude or include insects to do the job for you. Um, or to use hand pollination techniques to control the pollination. That's all you need to know about isolation distances. Mm -hmm.